Okay, welcome everyone. I'm so pleased that you can make it this Friday. Uh, many of you have already had the opportunity to meet Emeka Okereke, and tomorrow you'll have a fantastic opportunity to hear him uh, give a talk as part of the um, Artist in Residence series at Eskenazi Museum of Art. Um, today he's here to talk to you, mainly graduate students and also Carlos, about um, the, the way in which you work um, and collaborate and um, think about your career. Um, and so we'll let Emeka talk and then we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. I promise. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Beth. Um, yeah, first of all, it's been nice to be here in Indiana. My first time in the uh, Midwest of the US. So it's been, ha it's been, a, been having a completely different American experience. It's great. Um, so I heard that you already uh, discussed the Invisible Earth project in, in the class. So there isn't much to say about that anymore because you... Well, no, no um, these two students are in the class. These students are not. Okay. Yeah. Okay, okay. Uh, all right, so we'll get to it. Um, so I'm a, I'm a photographer, writer, filmmaker. I work with sound. Um, these days I just call myself an artist. A friend once asked me, so how are you going to, you know, call yourself? What are you going to say when people say, I just say, okay, I'm just going to say I'm an artist. But then I would say, let me explain. And that would be long, you know. <laughs> That this mention will be long. And again, this is a function of our time. And this is the point I'm trying to make that an artist is much more than the medium or the discipline. Um, I would say that I'm fortunate to have been born um, in the, towards the last decade of the 20th century and starting what I do in the 21st century. I started uh, my artistic journey exactly in 2001. That is beginning of the 21st century. So I make a point to call myself a 21st century artist. So that delineation is important because we are pioneers of something. All of us working in the 21st century. And this is how I move in the world. There is no one little action that is not significant. It's not like big revolutions of the likes of Fidel Castro and Che Guevara. But you wake up with your little revolution every day and you share it as much as you can. And you stand by it and you allow that be an embodied experience. That for me is how I move in the world. You make your own logic, but you're responsible for it. And you follow it through. Um, it's not subjectivity for the sake of it. It's not subjectivity out of convenience. It's not my agency, my agency, and then you forget that it comes with a lot of responsibility. To go through it, it's a journey you have to pass through it, understand it, make it become part of it. And so the reason why I put up this poem here, so that you understand, this poem for me is, of course, in hindsight, because it's 2020, <laughs> you know. But it says a lot. You know, especially you know when you talk about the last line and the voice of this this king. So the skin is not the emphasis; it is what it has to say. What you are called is not important. It is what you do in the world, and how you do in the world, and how you move in the world. That part is yet to be seen. But what you are called is given to you most of the time. It's projected on, onto you. But how you move in the world, I'm much more interested in that. So, um, I'm going to come to the Invisible Brothers Project. Uh, or perhaps let me even go there now, since much of what I'm going to be saying 
with the reference and invisible borders. I prepared it differently for this other class today, this afternoon. The workshop. Let me see, is it this one? So, I think this one. Let's, let's do this one. Yeah. So, in 2009, just uh, at the end of my studies at the Fine Art School of Paris, I started this project called Invisible Borders. This is a definitive image. This is a 2010. This image was made, second edition. And when I say at the end of my studies, you know, um, one would understand it as okay, um, that was you coming out of school. But well, it's important to note that I, before I got into fire art school, I was already an artist. So my time in the fire art school was that I would just basically all the time sneak off to go to art exhibitions. I would take part in the job of art fair, big exhibitions basically, and I would come back to the class. Um, so I had a unique position. Not everyone had that. In fact, I don't know how many artists was able to do that at that time. But that's also because of how I came to class. I came to class as an artist. So I make a point to say that uh, because uh, France was a formative um, time for me, but um, I was formed in Lagos by all those artists who were experimenting. Um, at the turn of the century, and playing with new media, uh, new media, which is photography and film, and that was a much more realistic um, learning environment for me, because then um, it wasn't about fulfilling some sort of, uh, uh, I would say, predefined. Uh, how would I put it? Predefined idea of, you know, what an artist is. You know, it's not a career. It's not. When I got to the Boza, I realized that's actually largely what it is. And then say it's an open place to learn as artists, but again, you have to follow all this. Thing. So speaking with James in Nakagawa now coming, and it's like I'm telling my students, but why would you even have that? Why should there be a frame like this? That those things are Kodak and Fuji. Why can't we have, why can't the, the, the photograph be, be, be circle, you know? And it might seem that that's a very flimsy uh, question to ask, but already that's to shift the mindset. So when I came to the Bose, I, I was already equipped with um, a different, you know, way of thinking. And, and when they would discuss history of art, and the school, and don't forget that the Boza is the place to be, you know, when you're in France. That's the school to be. Everything else is, you know, so I'm like in the middle of it. And that's where even you discuss history of art, there's no reference whatsoever of these people who has informed me, for which I came to France in the first place, you know. Right from day one, it was important for me to arrange my mindset that way, and I'm so happy that happened because that was how I moved. Um, I always say that I passed through the school, the school didn't pass through me. You know, I was very conscious of that. I was very selective with how, where, where I go, how I use my time there. It was for me about coming to complement my knowledge. So, and that was how at that time, Invisible Borders came into view. And it was basically tackling this big question of the century, which is borders. When you look at the African continent, you realize the only problem is the fact that there's all these cracks everywhere. And then by the, the more you know about it, and you find where you are in the history of it, you realize that you are not far off it's so only like 50, 50 years ago, for Mozambicans even earlier, <laughs> you know, um, since the independence. And the more you realize what was displaced by colonialism, you understand that all of this is just new. And 
immediately you realize that you have a lot of uh, role to play in that and shifting all. So this post-colonial condition we talk about, we are all involved in shaping it and giving it a direction. So as visual artists working with uh, photography, film, writing, um, which has media power. And this was very important for us. It was very strategic because we know the role of photography in the African continent. Anthropologists will tell you. We know how it's worked. And so it was very deliberate that we were using photography and then eventually writing and then film. Um, for the project. Every year we come together, we make road trips. And across the borders, the photographers, writers, filmmakers. When we started, so basically, this is the premise. Yeah, uh, let, me, let me make this. It was first of all to counteract that that image, not only the image of Africa, but the way we understand the African reality. We all grew up in this place, but the, what we see in the media doesn't really represent. And what's also very annoying is that every time you go to somebody who is knowledgeable and they are speaking authoritatively about their knowledge, it's all full of ignorance. That kind of paradox is annoying. <laughs> it's just annoying, it's plain, plain annoying that somebody with authority can speak of ignorance or God can speak from a place of ignorance. And so this, this, this for us was like, oh, there's an opening. And this is so important for me because much of the problems we're dealing with in, in the African continent is misplaced priority. Because there are some conversations we shouldn't be involved in at all. You shouldn't even be in that room when it's happening because it's not you. Just like Edward Said would say about Orientalism, that when the West talk about the East, everything they have said, researched about the East, says more about the West than about the East. It's important to understand this. The West was looking for a mirror of himself. That is not your conversation. It can happen. But you have to understand that that is. And it took us a long time to understand that sometimes you shouldn't even be part of that conversation because it is not for you. You are supposed to be elsewhere, having a different kind of, in, involving yourself in other kinds of knowledge about who you are. So Invisible was first of all, for us, a way of getting to know ourselves, an intimate knowledge with ourselves. It wasn't to justify, it wasn't to respond, it wasn't to re react. And as we go into the century more and more, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing and joyous to see art, artists or anyone, any thinker who works from this place, not to justify, but to think of it as autobiographical. It's cyclical, it comes back to you. It's your own journey. You, uh, the, you are the destination, so it's a foregone conclusion. So what matters now is the journey. The cyclical it comes back to you. And this is what has led us for the past 10 years now doing this project. It is constant coming back to ourselves. And so, in the beginning, following that um, what I just said now, we're more interested in the dramaturgy of the African space. We, we see things in the way we want to, first of all, capture that. So today, this is more like where we are. Now, we are 
pushing the project towards poetics of relation. We are pushing it beyond contending with the borders. We are pushing it beyond. Um, so we are going. We are going towards the, the, the fact that the world is connected, and that's because we've made different kinds of road trip beyond Africa. You know, we've traveled from Africa to Europe to demystify that distance between Africa and Europe. We didn't do it because Europe was a cool destination. Again, the destination does not matter. It's a foregone conclusion. It should have been that way. People should have been eating spices and chili already in, in, in France and Spain by now if that distance was not fictitious. I don't see any reason why after 500 years, 600 years, people are not eating plantain naturally in Berlin when the two continents are neighbors. It's a fictitious distance. So for us, it's important for us to just demystify that distance by saying we can travel by road. When you get to, to Morocco and crossing into, into Spain, it's only 30 minutes of ferry. Everything else is a construct. So this is where we are now, where we are thinking of Africa as a story of journeys. I think it is time for us to begin to you know tilt towards that. But it's not really going you know, into the future. Some, it's always been so that Africa has always been a story of journey. That's the real narrative of Africa, the story of journey. So now we've passed through all this uh, um, uh, experiences, you know, slavery, colonialism. But our narrative today is that without disavowing all of that, that it is a story of journey. So this is where we are now, trying to understand how to conceptualize um, our lived experiences in the African continent, but also beyond. But as artists and as thinkers, to be able to articulate that in, in a way that becomes a knowledge that, can, that we can share through what we do. So this is from 2018 our last road trip in Africa before the lockdown. But before that, we were more interested in the dramaturgy of the, of the African story. And so photographers were looking at those paradoxes, contradictions, and to sort of like put them all in one frame. This is the point where I begin to get bored you know, by the convention that documentary photography is not artistic photography. I get bored of that because, again, that's convention for other people. For us, the everyday space is a highly conceptual space. And now it takes someone who looks to put the frame. It's not like in the West where everything is arranged clean and nice. So people are looking to do their mise-en-scene in the studio. But for the African space, the everyday space is a highly charged and highly conceptual space. Now it takes people who think, but they move with the thinking and the thinking moving body to see. And this is actually where, you know, uh, uh, photographers come in. So the first, uh, artists of the road trip were well, mainly photographers. We had only one writer, and she came on the trip by accident. But it was a, a beautiful accident because it opened up um, that relationship between photography and writing. So I'm going to just freestyle here. That's my best uh, way of talking in terms of, 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 uh, of being, actually. Um, The writer who came on the trip, she was also a poet. And so she was, on one hand, writing poems, but on the other hand, um, documenting uh, the trip through writings. But it will eventually evolve, the writing would eventually evolve beyond documenting the trip to actually 
you know, um, being integral to the, to the process. So continuing that dramaturgy, <laughs> we're interested in saying this is a thing. And it's important to say that Invisible has preceded Instagram by one year. So before the everyday Africa hashtag showed up, you know, we were already thinking about that. And I think that Invisible has inspired that everyday Africa thing because um, imagine this image, shine, shine, bobo, uh, look at this image. Yeah. <laughs> but, but, but what's interesting is that because of what, how the light is falling on the, on the petrol, it looks like the beer, right? Yeah. And these are the little moments that we find every, in every day that is intriguing that, again, it wouldn't make the headlines. If it makes the headline, it wouldn't be a thing. It wouldn't show up on Jazeera or, you know, all the, no, it won't. But this is how we read our space. All of us will stop and we will laugh. Ah, this, ah, look at, look at that coincidence. But as photographers, as who know how to place things in, in the frame, we can see these things this way. So this was actually how the project started going, first of all. And it was also exciting to do this. You know, and the photographers would move with this kind of way of looking at all this uncanny paradox that it is the function of a post-colonial condition. That's what is happening here, really. You know. You see images like this, you say, how did it even happen? You know, how, what is going on here? And we also try not to project a lot of meaning to that. So they can read it as you want, but it's an African space and an African reality. It's already enough that it's not trying to tell you something. It's not trying to tell you something about war or it's not trying to be thematic at all. And then sometimes, you know, it gets, you know, allegorical as well and metaphorical. <clears throat> and we also suggest that in, in the title sometimes. And then we'll talk about the future and the and, and newness. You know, all of that we are looking. But then you will also see images like this, where the artists are also the photographer here is Ray Daniels Okubu and he made a road trip four times before he before his untimely death in 2013 he died of a kidney um, disease but he's made a road trip four times in fact from day one my best friend by the way um and he would always drive but he would have his camera always beside him and now this is where i begin to get into how we are positioned on the trip, how from what vintage point you see the image, because the photographer's second sight is his or her presence. What you are photographing is your positionality. It is not what you are what you are seeing. It is from where you see. So in this case, look at this image. Very uncanny. We were parked on the side. By the way, being checked by the police, and he was waiting. But then he was looking through the rear view to see this image that is in and of itself a post-colonial image. <laughs> but it was passing by and then he photographed it. And he picked up his camera and reacted to that. And you will see moments like this a lot where it became about from where you're photographing. So in class, in a photographic class, I'm always asking the, the, the students, What's your position? How is your camera entering that scene? And what does that mean for you? Is it always center? Have you considered changing your position? There are so many ways you can see an image. You can see it from a rear view mirror, you can see it from different places. What does that mean for you? And so that also started leading us towards the subjectivity of the artist. Turning the, turning the gaze 
to 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 you. You are the one. The, the invisible borders is internal. So our project started shifting away from looking at the public space or trying to tell the story to becoming the story. And then you now had artists now bringing objects and having interventions and affecting the the uh, the uh, the scene. So this is Kemi. On the road trip, she decided to make this placard that everywhere she goes, that it, you know, it's like a, a stamp of her presence. But she will find scenes and insert herself. But at the same time, what is happening here is we are developing a new cartography. Because the tagline you see of the project, Trans-African project, that Trans-African there is not a coincidence. It is inspired by the Trans-African highways that was constructed in the colonial times. That was not to unite the continent or to create a, a free flow, but rather to connect the continent according to the colonizers, you know, economic and political uh, interests. But now that we have inherited the continent, I believe so, you know, minus China, <laughs> um, uh, um, now that we've inherited that road, the Trans-African, what kind of um, road can, are, are we going to build? The Trans-African Highway of the Mind. So this is actually something that is tangible. It's actually it's not just on, on the conceptual realm. But every time we take our body and presence to these places, we are remapping. And this notion of remapping will be the main feature of the 21st century. How do we remap the world with our body and our presence? That will be the main feature of the And we're going to see more and more of that. But that remapping also means we are going to re-understand identity and how it works in the world. For now, we are still holding it as something to be possessed. My identity. And that's why it doesn't, it's not animated. But identity is not something to possess as a thing. It is a verb. It is what it does and where it does as you move in the world. That's what identity is. But I, I, I see that as we, as we continue to walk this way and think this way, there will come a time when we are courageous enough to allow that sense of self to be precarious. Knowing that it's all autobiographical, that it's cyclical, it's going to come back to you again. That you as a person is a destination and therefore a foregone conclusion. <laughs> that that identity is so that you can do this. It's cyclical. It's not, you're not giving anything away. It always comes back to you, but in an enriching way. By the time we get, we, 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 we get to that, uh, 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 that, that courage to do that. Again, James was saying, I'm turning 60, and now he's doing a new body of work. For the first time, self-portrait. And then he says, in the, uh, Japanese uh, cosmology that every 12 years is a circle. So now he's got five. 60 means five. But at 60, you become a baby again. But then he now said, what if being a baby means that you return now to yourself. You become self-referential. And that is why she, he's now for the first time doing uh, self-portraits in his work. Isn't that interesting? It's amazing, no? Just this morning, one hour, we've had this intense conversation. You know? So we, we, we get that inkling as we're on the road. And this is when this young, you know, not even turned 25, came on the trip. And she was already thinking like this. But we're already allowing space for that to happen in the project. 
That is the project. It's not us going on the trip. It's the fact that she can come and do that, and we can say it is actually a worthy for the world. You know why? Because every time we are traveling on the road, we are carrying a projector. Every three days we stop. Before we go into that photograph again, we come together. We discuss the work. The photographer, the writer, the filmmaker, we're all discussing that work. What are we seeing in it? We're experiencing it together. We don't need a curator to come and tell us what we are seeing. We don't need an expert to come and tell us. We don't need an anthropologist to come and tell us. We have, yeah. I knew I knew, I knew you were going to say. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. they, they, they can tell us after, after. They can tell us after. But then, because it's so tied to the experience, we are not discussing it because it's going to be the photograph that will change the world. We are not discussing it because it's going to be that photograph that is going to now be the definitive photograph of. I don't even know how Invisible has got this popular. Because we were doing everything just the other way around, you know. But we were doing it because it was a process for us. It was a process of learning and generating knowledge in a way that you can, you can trace the genealogy of that knowledge and how it forms. It's so important that you can, you can, make, you can, you can see how the, the, the dots of your logic connects across the people you've, had, you've, had, you've shared experiences with. with you know? it's, it's, such a, it's so enriching when we have conversations like yesterday, six hours, you know? Six hours. Yeah, over dinner. You know, they chased us out. Yeah, from there. But what was happening was that it wasn't a disembodied conversation. People weren't throwing things from. We were constantly connecting our logics together. We were always finding points where our logics connect. You do that a, a lot, it becomes a space for learning. And the road trip is exactly like that, where you don't need to go too far to for the references you can you can draw from each person's experience and it becomes exciting the younger photographers all of a sudden say wow so there's actually something in what I, I, I I'm doing you know the way I think actually can hold its own because we can we can give it uh, yeah we can give it uh, 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 its own genealogy there So even Ray also continued. So you see that they started introducing props of their own. Um, creating works like this. And by that time, we've had conversation that the everyday is important. So there's almost like a undiscussed um, uh, attempt to always leave things in the everyday so that when you look at the image you're a little bit confused why obviously this guy is works there but then if you look really closely then you see there is something wrong <laughs> you know there's something wrong it has to be like something that just seeps in not overt because this notion of the overt is also something that is always expected from, from Africa it can be subtle that it has to be punchy, you know. Stories have to be punchy. Headlines, headlines upon headlines. <clears throat> but those of us who grew up in the continent knew that our lives are not all headlines. They are so banal <laughs> every day, you know. There's somebody who asked me like all these, you know, artifacts that we see in, in Europe. Do you remember seeing any of them when you were growing up? It's like no, I didn't remember seeing any of them because. I wasn't thinking they were artifacts. <laughs> That's why I didn't see it. But we used them. Our chairs, our mortars. They were all cabins, right? But did you notice we were cabins? It was only when you got to Europe and sit in a vitrine that you'd be like, ah, wow. And then artists began to now be self referential more and more. Um, creating using their body now. This is where the project began to move to um, the notion of using our body really and presence in that mapping. So the project became more and more self-referential. Artists are now looking at themselves 
This is the work of Uchok by Raha called uh, uh, Finding Rest. And that was when we realized that the, the, the act of crossing borders, the trip itself, takes a toll on the body. And then we started thinking about that from there. How do you represent that toll it takes on the body? And then we started using our body in that sense as an instrument. This will continue. We will perform and photograph at borders. Do some performative work. At, in the Ajazira, you saw it, right? Um, the film. That was how we started. That is all part of that. This was when I was making that work. Christian and Jan Peter is, is, a, is an art historian. We got to this, and he was thinking of it as St. George and the Fallen Dragon. And so we said it. But at every point in time, we are thinking of the road as full of metaphors and all signs. So it's, it's very tactile for us. It's very, you know, we don't, the concepts are all there. And it's so important that we bring that into. Into, into the work. Every part of the road for us is, is you know, like, look, look at that. The sky, everything. So it, it, when we travel, it, it wasn't, it, it's not like photographers, wow, let's make some Ansel Adam photos, kind of photos of beautiful landscapes. It doesn't mean anything to us. <laughs> what matters to us is how we, how we are able to uh, to capture something about that feeling of being on the road. In Sarajevo. So we will perform. And then we will we'll, we'll play around with, with, with composites, objects. Now eventually we get into after so many writings, it became um, this complementary association between writing and, and, and photography. And that's how many you know, writers have come and, and work. And we see that photographers and writers work a lot together. And they, many writers who come on the trip go on to write about photography or even begin to make photos. So the likes of Imani de Duma. Yinka Ilujaba, Keuguede, all of them actually are making photos and writing about. But when they came on the trip, they were writers. Um, yeah. So I'll just let you enjoy that relationship between the text and the image you will have. So on the last road trip, especially for myself, but also um, uh, last road trip before the lockdown, uh, season 18. Uh, I was more interested in how um, images are read or how images operate in the everyday. So there is now, again, this is really like where I am now, where there's a reading, the notion of reading. So photography for me is no longer um, make great photos, but how do you read the images already there, even without a camera? And so because I write as well, so when I make a photograph, it's not always for the photograph. It's a way of continuing that reading. Of the of, of the of the image that is in the space.
the 2018 road trip took us um, in the route of the Bantu migration um, around uh, from Nigeria going towards the east of, of, uh, of Africa. And somewhere around the border between Nigeria and Cameroon, you have these monoliths, and they have been there for that long. And so we met an archaeologist who took us around and told us the story of it and tried to, it's an open, open air like museum and people come there to research and he explained to us some of the signs and try as much as possible to give us a sense of uh, you know so like the knowledge that's embedded in it now when we came back from here, we decided to do something. All of us on the trip, we co-authored a text about this experience, which you will find on, on our website for this road trip. We have a, a, so every time we make a road trip, we have a dedicated website for it. It's actually an app, mobile app. You can download it to your iOS or Android. So every time, there are many ways to navigate it. You can navigate it according to the artist, each, each artist posting, because as we go on the trip, um, every other day, every two days, the artists are posting snippets of the work they're making. So there's another aspect, of, and it's been so since uh, 2009, since the inception of the project. Um, we wanted to share. There was also a project that came during the internet period. So we were also micro-blogging, so, so to speak. And we wanted that. We wanted to sort of like break away from this esoteric confine of the academia and the actual. You know, we sort of like try to sabotage the whole thing, really, in a sense. <laughs> you know? um, we do it. It's, it's thinking and everything. But we still, we, we, we try to undermine it by giving all the snippets. <laughs> and breadcrumbs, but it's also, again, central to that is the remapping. We wanted to leave traces as we go. And the, 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 the app, uh, the mobile apps are made that way. So you can navigate like, it through the artist or um, through the medium, the discipline, but also as a map. So you can, so if you, if you turn on the map, you will see a line as we travel and you see dots. If you click on that dot, you see all the content published in that place. In our 2014 road trip, you will see a line going from Lagos all the way to Sarajevo. But on those dots are all the thoughts we've put together on the road. So we came together and we co-authored a, a, a text around this experience, each and every one of us. Exercises like that is what makes it um, for us, a communal um, lived experience. Because we came out of there feeling the same way, feeling that we've had a glimpse into um, the past in a way that is just an aberration to, to, to what we usually know. And we came out feeling really strong about it, especially how the, the man explained things to us. Um, and so we wrote a text on that.
So now, when it comes to his vision, this is where it gets interesting. Because, and this is the beauty of this Invisible Spot, that we have somehow succeeded to also make it a, like a critical project in the art world without necessarily seeking out that navigation. Um, that's also what told us that we are doing something right, because we are doing this on the road, but at the same time, um, we are able to bring it into um, important uh, spaces. And none of those uh, were actually us going out of our way. It's never happened before where, you know, we went to someone and said, oh, we have this great project called Invisible. I said, do you know it? Uh, we want to get, can, can, we, can we have it, you know, at the computer? No. We're always written and like, wow, interesting. So the project has been at the Venice Vienna, Central Pompidou, at the New Museum in New York, at the Aperture uh, in New York as well, a phone in Amsterdam, Grotus Bar in Berlin, all those big places, but also we make our makeshift exhibitions on the road as we travel. We have been to, we've done exhibitions in Accra. We actually did the first open public space photographic exhibition in Accra. And in N'Djamena, Addis Ababa. So yeah, and when we show the work, we try as much as possible to show the work as a complementary as association between process and outcome. We are focused on giving the audience a sense of being on the road, because that's a grand metaphor. We don't want you to see anything. We don't want you to see anything coherent in that sense. We want the audience to come in and feel, ah, what a journey. Imagine themselves being on a journey. Imagine themselves going on a trip. Especially, you know, Africans coming to see our exhibition. We want them to imagine themselves going on a journey. It's not, I'm not interested in telling you a story about how homosexuality is, is being read or feminism is being read in Africa. I'm not interested in that. And I'll say it again in front of the camera. I'm not interested in that, you know? <laughs> Others will do that. But our, our narrative is a journey, about journeys. We want people to come in and think on the road. Because in there is the, 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 the power of dreams. And this was what was attacked by coloniality. ability to dream, to celebrate one's imagination, as Franz Fanon would put it. Much of how we dealt with that is to resist, to respond, to react, to what? But the real thing is how to celebrate one's, how to return to that celebration of the imagination. But that's to return to the power of dreams. So we try as much as possible to create this poetry, you know, with the images, so that people can just reflect and find themselves going on the road on a journey. So it's been like a multimedia installation where we try as much as possible to put the images, the, the, the films, and the text in conversation. And it's actually uh, uh, amazing when you're in the space because it's this is happening. And so the text is complementing the images, but not in a direct way. Um, they are going away, they are coming back. They are also leaving you space to reflect. You know, there's sound from the from 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 the from the video. At the Venice Vienna, we projected the video on this wall um, with all the cracks. And it was by O.P. Emozo who invited us and we told them that we wanted to not have anything on the wall but to project on the walls of the arsenal, knowing that there's a whole lot of colonial um, history attached to the Venice Vienna. Because when the Venice Vienna was there, 1906, 1907, 
you know, the French pavilion, the British pavilion, and all of that was exactly the same time they were colonizing Africa. So given that in the first century, what, our, our work is also this superimposition and projecting our narrative onto what is there. It's not necessarily to destroy it. It's not, someone has asked, has asked us many times, oh, are you trying to now take away the borders, um, uh, uh, remove it, stop it? Say no, we're basically trying to undermine it and say that it, is, it has outlived its usefulness. But how do you do that? You project onto it. At best, you get a complicated image. And that is already strong enough as a, as a, as a stepping stone towards something else. Or as part of that notion of newness. And this newness is not about things being new. It's important to make a difference. It's not about, because the art world is obsessed with new, the new thing. Things being new is different from newness. Newness is a constant cyclical. It is to find that in-between space that exists in duality when things come together and in just a position or in superimposition, there is a newness that happens in there. It is not about discarding the old to find the new. Not necessarily. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm finishing now because we have the exhibition part, right? So this is what the exhibition has been, this is what we've been trying to do. And we, are, we continue uh, to push uh, this as well to find other forms. Like for instance, and this is something I have also discussed with Alison. You know, the notion of cartography. How do you reimagine the cartography? Uh, you know, and what we try to do here is you will see that we try to create our own imaginary cartography. And if you go for that, for that, for that, and you will see that in some places, so there's Rosso and Ibida, they're not close to each other, these are two different countries. But what brings all these places together is that we have carried our body and presence to these places. So they are not imaginary in that sense. They are indicative of the fact that we have been to these places. So one might think that, oh, we just, you know, did a nice, you know, abstract map and put names in it. But that's not what it is. It's the fact that for every uh, name of this uh, city here, we have actually been there present, experienced there present, travel through it. So when you see Iwida or Gitam beside Amsterdam, you begin to imagine, but what is that map? The map is that we have been at Iwida and also Amsterdam by road, and we have created from that place. So these are one of the ways we have, um, um, and this whole idea of having this so like disjointed, not continuous, map is something that we started from day one, which is when we were designing, making our design, we said we don't want to have any continuous map of, 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 the, of the continent. We want to make it porous. So, yeah. Let me now go ahead and show you the many ways we have approached exhibitions. You see, this is the reason why when I, some these days I don't even like talking about invisible it because it takes all the whole <laughs> before I will never get to yeah. But that's great. So yeah, we've shown in different ways, public space all the time, um, looking for different formats, but also is that combination between uh, photography, writing, film. Um, so again, it's not only multimedia, there's many ways we have. Like in this, in, in, in Bamako, so we had this. And so, translated into French, put there. And one would say, oh, well, it's a poster. But this is actually carefully talked to poster because we made posters that are resistant to, 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 to the weather. People are still telling us it's still there till now because it's intentional. 
But we wanted it to be such an everyday thing so that they can stop and look at it. Like, it's nothing. It's just a poster. But again, it's not. You know. That is much more interesting for us. I was going to talk about my own thing, but now we stop here.